Hello, welcome to this ESS um, revision video for module 4.2. Today we're looking at freshwater access and the impacts of humans on our access to fresh water. So as previously said in the last video, which you're welcome to go back and look at, um, freshwater budget is the quantitative estimate of the amounts of water in storage and flows of the water cycle. So as I previously said, only about 3% of the um, water is available um, to drink as fresh water because 97% is salt water. And actually 2% of that is locked away in the glaciers. So there's less really than 1% of water that's on the planet available for us to drink. Um, and 40% of human populations live within water scarcity. So therefore they don't have an adequate supply of fresh water. Now, we use water globally for mainly three different reasons, domestic, industry and agriculture. And 70 percent of our water um, is used globally for, for agriculture. So agriculture has a big environmental impact um, as a result. Obviously, in different areas, there's going to be different amounts of water use. Um, and you can see that domestic generally is the smallest use, um, apart from in Europe and Central Asia, uh, whereas industry is next, and then agriculture is the main use. Now, obviously, this is slightly misleading, because if you were to say here, you'd see that South Asia is the highest use of water. But actually, don't forget, South Asia um, will produce food that will be used in all of these different regions of the world. So it's quite unfair to blame one area of the world because we all consume food from around the world in the modern time. Um, just to show you then, well, where does that food come from? Where does that water get used? Well, the, the think about it like this, in a food chain, you have plants that are eaten by animals and the plants need water to grow, they need irrigation. So the worst, um, the worst water requirements are beef, who use the most water. Nuts actually produce, need a lot of water, um, whereas other products use a lot less water. Um, so one way which we could look at our sustainable food production could be to look at how much water each thing consists of. So for example, changing from beef uh, to chicken, if you're a, a meat eater, would it save a huge amount of water. So water stress is obviously not equal around the world. Around the world, there's a very uneven distribution um, and this can have an impact on um, water directly or on crop production as a result. So some parts of um, the world have got very low water stress so in this color, it's the yellow color. So for example, here you see Russia and, and these areas where it's cold and often um, snowy has low water stress. But then we also have high level of water stress and making sense sort of around the equator where the temperature is hotter um, due to more exposure to the sun. Now, water stress can also um, be linked to um, different countries, but there can be issues with water because water doesn't always just flow through one river. So a very polluted river, the Danube River, um, is also called the Dirty Danube River, flows through multiple countries in Europe. And as um, it flows through these countries, it gets gradually and gradually more polluted. So whilst water stress is about the lack of water a lot of time, it's also about the quality of, of um, water. So the water is getting removed in this, this river, but it's also getting polluted. So therefore it's, it's getting less and less useful as it goes down the river. So what we're going to focus on now is sustainable usage of water moving. So one of the uh, key things that we need to be aware of is that water isn't always stored in just rivers. One area might be aquifers. So around the world there is a high um, percentage of areas that rely on aquifers for their water supply. Mexico City is a good example of this. And what um, an aquifer is, is it is a layer of porous rock between two layers of impermeable rock. So for example, in this diagram, we have this layer here, which is your impermeable rock, this layer here, which is your impermeable rock, it's a solid rock and clay. Between them, the water builds up and that water 
can then be stored in um, this rock here where there is um, sorry, my pen's not working where there is a gap in there um, so what happens is the water is filled by infiltration so it goes into the um, into the aquifer during rain and where the rock reaches the surface so this is the only place really here uh, where the actual uh, rock can sort of reach so the water can enter the rock so this is the, the only part at the top here I'm trying to show you here my pen's not working there you go. So this is the only part here where the water can actually recharge and enter now that means there's very even though there's a huge amount of rock here there is a very small area for the water to infiltrate so therefore water um, recharging is often quite slow um, and humans will often use it quickly and therefore the aquifer will often be used up before it can recharge and therefore it will eventually so there are two issues from our water consumption you can see globally our water consumption has significantly increased as populations have got bigger the water pop usage obviously clearly follows that as well um, and the two issues are water scarcity i.e. the lack of water that's available, but also water degradation. And this means the water quality drops. So like that dirty river we talked about a moment ago, the water deteriorates because we're polluting it and um, treating it badly, and therefore it becomes less suitable for use. So in terms of water usage, um, there is obviously climate change is always going to have a big impact. So climate change is affecting the distribution it's affecting the rainfall patterns so some parts are getting more often and heavier some parts are getting less it's becoming uneven to what we're being used to low water levels as a result um, are happening but particularly in certain rivers there is low water levels because of the amount we've taken out so the Colorado River as it enters Mexico is effectively a stream rather than a river so the Mexicans don't get as much of that river water compared to the Americans who use it for agriculture rivers can also become slowed due to sedimentation because of um, our effect on the land or from runoff and that can make them shallower um, underground aquifers are becoming exhausted um, due to agriculture and that extraction of um, aquifers is too fast, meaning it is unsustainable. Fresh water gets contaminated and irrigation um, is causing degradation because solids are moving into the water. Um, and what is also happening is evaporation of the water from irrigation. When the water is left on the fields, it evaporates out, but it takes away the top layer of um, minerals leaving um, what we call salinization of the soil and eutrophication is happening which is something we'll look at in detail in a later point and that is generally caused by sewage or fertilizer as a result of our behaviors one other thing which i think is worth you just being aware of is warm water um, can enter via power plants so warm water is classed as a pollution it's got too much energy in it and when you have warm water that means there is less oxygen in that water so it's negative to the organisms that normally live there so human populations are not going to start decreasing anytime soon so we need a solution for this water usage so we can first of all we could increase the supplies of fresh water so how can we do that well we can use the opportunity to store it more when it does rain so building more reservoirs which is something that the uk is definitely looking at um, redistribution of water so we can direct water to certain ways um, as we need it and desalination of water so we'll talk about that at the end of this video we can get seawater and take the salt out of it and we can use rainwater harvesting systems so for example some of these pictures um, show the, these things where you can use maybe the rainwater that you've collected from your house collect it up and use it for things like toilets but you don't need that absolute clean level of water 
It can also artificially recharge um, aquifers. So what you can do, as you can see here, is you could build a reservoir and capture water above a recharge point in the aquifer, and that would then allow the aquifer to be directly recharged. We can reduce the domestic use, um, and obviously we do this. We try and do this a lot with things like toilets and things like that. Um, but we need more efficient devices, such as toilets that don't use as much water, such as showers that work more efficiently. Um, we use closed water systems to wash cars and collect the pollution. So instead of just letting things go down the drain and into the rivers, they need to be collected up and treated before return. Um, but we need to also recycle grey water, which is the water that comes from our drains and from our washing, um, which we can use for different uses. Um, agriculture is obviously a big, big um, issue and obviously that links to domestic use as well. So we need to use irrigation reduction. So we could use drought resistant crops. Instead of just spraying the fields openly, we could use closed pipes to take the water exactly where it's needed and using a trickle system, which just gently releases water slowly rather than spraying huge amounts of water. Because spraying huge amounts of water leads to high levels of evaporation loss. We could reduce the use of pesticides. So remember, this is not just about the use of water, but the degradation of it. If we reduce the use of pesticides, less pesticides will enter the fresh water and therefore the water will be a higher quality. We can use organic fertilizers, which means like cow manure and horse manure, because that releases nutrients slowly and stops the excess getting into the water, degrading the water. We can use biological controls instead of pesticides. And we can remove pollutants from industrial wastewater. So if we treat what goes back into the water better, we should have more fresh water available as a result. And we can prevent warm water from being released from power stations, storing it up until it's cooled down and then releasing it back in. The problem. So there has been um, attempts to, ink to prevent water shortages around the world, some of them more successful than others. Um, and in Israel particularly, there has been um, a lack of water. And you can see um, that it does link slightly to politics because the World Health Organization said that you need a um, minimum of 100 litres of water per day. And depending where you live in Israel, depends on how much water you get. And that's all linked to politics. But Israel has a general water shortage due to population growth due to improve quality of life. So people in Israel will be using more like dishwashers, showers and things like that. Um, less rainfall due to climate change as, as a result of getting warmer, irrigation of crops, water disputes with other um, which is all causing a problem. So one thing Israel has done is invested in desalination of water, which is where you take salt water and you remove the salt to make it drinkable tap water. And this um, has um, been an issue, but Israel have led on this. So Israel has become um, one of the world leaders on this because whilst the desalination plants use high amounts of energy, with renewable energies becoming more um, usable, it has become a more sustainable method of purifying water and taking the salt out and making seawater usable for irrigation of there are two methods you can use for desalination. The first one is distillation. And what you do is you have the water that you're going to, um, the salt water in number one there, you heat it up until the water boils. The water then leaves, but the salt is left in the um, container here at the bottom. The water then is cooled down, it condenses, and you get pure water as a result in the final bit here at number four. Another method which you just need to be aware of, but I wouldn't worry about learning too much, is reverse osmosis. And basically pressure is applied here at um, number one, okay, and that forces seawater through this membrane, okay, it's semi-permeable membrane, and it's only small enough to allow the water to go through, the salt and the contaminants have to stay behind, and as a result you end up with pure water. Now both of these methods are good methods in theory to desalinate so much water is needed that both processes are going to be expensive and this all links to energy. So as renewables develop, solar panels develop, 
this should become a more viable option around the world.